Alvin Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks, his website rickackerman.com. Welcome back to the show, Rick. Well, thank you for inviting me on, Jim. It is always a pleasure. Rick, the New York Stock Exchange Index uh, falling horribly earlier in the week on news that uh, the U.S.-China trade talks weren't going well and more tariffs are going to be imposed by both sides. But I wonder, was it really the tariff talk, or is this a case of new record highs were set last week? The market is going to adjust a little bit. Maybe have a bit of a correction, and then the next two days go up again. Well, I was a, definitely a free trader, but I'm kind of coming around. Uh, you know, the advantage of free trade uh, is there in classical economics, as uh, expounded on by Adam Smith. Um and the idea is that you always benefit economically if you buy your stuff from countries that produce it more cheaply than you do. Um, and that means that it frees up savings. You, the cost savings, uh, in theory, can be invested in things that, uh, in this case, the USA can produce more efficiently than uh, its uh, competitors. But the problem is that capital no longer moves that way. And if you have these savings from buying cheap stuff from China, it doesn't go into, let's say, automobile manufacturing that could produce more cheaply even than in South Korea. It goes into stuff like Uber. So the, the, the huge hoaxes like Uber, Uber are sucking up so much capital that it no longer moves advantageously from this, uh, this doctor, according to how the doctrine of comparative advantage would suggest it might. So, um, it's amazing how in the late 20s, the whole Smoot Holy thing, you can almost kind of take the headlines of the day and run them up against the ups and downs in the stock market. And I, I guess there's a lot of curve fitting there, but it makes it look like the talk about the tariffs was the driving force behind the markets. And finally, the great tra uh, crash was uh, a result of the Smoot-Hawley, but it actually didn't get enacted until a couple years after the stock market crashed. So I'm sort of coming around to the idea that the U.S. is really going to reap a net advantage in um, in these tariffs, that, that it's China that's really got problems. And they're going to start losing sales to the U.S. and other countries that are going to ramp up the production. Will be able to buy with countries that will be pleased to trade with us. So, um, and I guess on the monetary side, uh, <clears throat> someone, maybe even Trump himself, has made the case. Well, he did actually this morning by saying we should make, uh, particularly the farmers, whole again, simply by uh, providing subsidies because they've been hit pretty hard. Uh, by these tariffs already, but uh, backing up to the economic theory of it, it is that uh, a country always has the option of monetizing the cost of uh, increased tariffs. So I'm kind of a, uh, I, I think, uh, the bottom line is I think the stock market's a buy here for all the fretting and whining that it's done already concerning tariffs. What do you think is going to happen with the S&P 500? I've got a 3095 target. We're currently at 2852, so that allows for about a 240-point rally, which would take the Dow uh, currently 25665 up to around 28,000, just a little bit below it. What stocks are going to be driving the growth? Well, I think the lunatic, lunatic stocks, the stocks that uh, the institutional geniuses there there's like six of them they buy and that creates the 
the impression that we've got a rip roaring bull market. Uh, so the loony bin stocks uh, are Apple, uh, the Fang stocks for Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Um, Microsoft is certainly in that group, but I think Microsoft is really the solidest of the bunch because they've made a very successful transition to a, uh, a subscription model. So it's not the old Microsoft that we used to curse and execrate some time ago because they would take your perfectly serviceable operating system and make it obsolete in three years. So, uh, but I think that the buying will be focused uh, in that, that very clever way on, on just a relative handful of stocks, although, yes, the rising tide will uh, eventually lift all boats. Now, Uber's initial public offering, their shares fell like a rocket going straight downhill. Why did that happen, and why would somebody buy into Uber, a company that's never made money? Uber's a fraud. Um, you know, there was a, I mean, I mean, almost a criminal fraud, but uh, it, there's so much complicity here in the the accounting that Uber has used to for to create out of whole cloth a eighty billion dollar valuation, somewhat less than that. It's had a stock has had a ten percent sell off since it went public um, earlier in the week, um, or, or last Friday, I guess it was. But um, you know, Uber. The fallacy here is that uh, the Uber as a company can make money when individual drivers are barely cutting it. You know, it's not like you get rich driving an Uber car, and therefore it's not like Uber is going to be hugely profitable based on expanding that model globally. So they've done a lot of things to essentially hide expenses. That, that, that they can claim that they were actually profitable in the last quarter if they use some of the most devious accounting you can possibly imagine. Uh, one example is that they don't uh, subtract marketing costs and promotional deals, which is what they've used to, to, to try to beat Lyft's brains in. Uh, they don't even subtract those from uh, what they would call profits. So so anyway, the, the, the e Lyft has its own very dubious accounting standards to make it look more profitable or less less unprofitable than it's been, but um, but it's not going to fly. I mean, the, 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 there's of course the competition factor. Lyft and Uber are uh, beating each other's heads in, but um, there's also at, at a lower level there's no entry barrier. You could become Uber tomorrow in a small way, and and tens of thousands of uh, Uber, Uber drivers will. Uh, there are software packages out there that allow you to set up your own Uber network, Uber-like network, and to recruit drivers. But the big thing is whether the, the, the ruling goes against Uber and Lyft as to whether their drivers are contractors or employees. And if the latter, you may as well kiss your investment in Uber or Lyft goodbye because it'll be worthless. And if the companies are more, never going to be profitable to begin with, that that goal will be even more remote uh, if they wind up having to, uh, you know, treat employees like, um, like uh, treat treat their drivers like employees. They'll have health care expenses and pension sockaways and and even operating expenses of the automobiles. So that's a big risk, and the other huge risk written about in the Wall Street Journal nicely was that uh, everywhere Uber, Uber or Lyft seek, seek to operate, they're going against a kind of loose coalition that unites local government with the unions. It could be the taxi taxi fleet drivers or whoever, but in, in each case there is this uh, implicit alliance or explicit alliance between uh, local government and and the unions, it's going to constantly go against uh, the big ride-hailing companies. In British Columbia, we don't have Uber or Lyft yet. The government says it will allow ride-sharing, but they said there's insurance concerns. And the drivers will have to have the same qualifications as taxi drivers, the same kind of training, the same kind of licenses, emergency uh, response training, and, and stuff like that. Would that make it too prohibitively expensive for them to even start business here? 
Well, just more difficult, and that is certainly an example. You have a coalition of uh, government and and the unions working to shut out Uber and Lyft. Uh, it it looks a lot more innocuous than that. It's certainly not unreasonable that um, the local uh, the franchisor or the, the whoever is granting licenses have uh, concerns about the the uh, the drivers themselves, or they they pass criminal background check, drug checks, or whatever. So, so where you have that coalition operating between unions and local government, which is essentially everywhere on the planet, um, the demands they will make on Uber and Lyft are, are, are reasonable, really. But at some point, they can become uh, not. They can become prohibitively restrictive. Like if you have to meet all the requirements, you won't even bother to operate there. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, is Amazon getting so big that it needs to be broken up? Well, here's my my theory on on that. It's uh, it came to me. I was at a Florida grocery store, Publix, and I wanted a particular product in the dairy section that was out. And they said, "Well, we're getting in a shipment." And actually, the product I wanted didn't come in that shipment. They said, "Well, it'll come in another." So all these grocers have uh, it, it's a big problem just to store, uh, to stock all varieties of things. And it hurts their profitability that they've got so many things that they need to provide just to keep people coming to the stores. Um, but selection is a, is a big part of the enticement. But, but Amazon right now is conceivably headed toward operating on such a scope that they don't really have to care what customers want. Uh, they, they do up to a point. But they will be more, uh, they'll be more selective, uh, simply because they can be. They will eventually settle on carrying the stuff that, uh, sells the best where the profit margins are the highest. And I think that Amazon is kind of pulling a Walmart. Uh, years ago I worked with a publishing company that was, uh, had a, one of its authors was a guy who was writing this book, books about we gotta stop Walmart. It was already too late, really, and at that point, Walmart was on its way to uh, devastating many, many local local businesses. And uh, in the same way that we've been sort of conditioned to just order things from Amazon and not go out to shop, that may actually come to the food sector. And there's this thinking now that nobody's really got a handle on becoming profitable in the grocery business, the margins are already pretty tight, and to add in a delivery component and still make money is really difficult. But what you see happening is that Amazon is building these huge warehouses. They're really kind of, I would say that they're Trojan horses, and uh, they'll reach the point where they can, they'll make it impossible really, even even for Walmart to get in the game. Walmart is the biggest seller of groceries right now in the country, but they don't have, uh, I hesitate to say even Walmart doesn't have the capital to do what Walmart's doing, what uh, Amazon is doing. But what Amazon is doing is building, uh, <clears throat> these aren't just stores like Walmart has. They are centers that are geared very specifically <coughs> toward uh, delivering products profitably. They're, they're already, Amazon is already at the point of one-day delivery. 
So they've got they've got the warehousing and the the shipping down to a science. It's going to be very hard, even for your number one grocer, uh, Walmart, to 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 compete in that game. They're doing it now because it's because Amazon hasn't tightened the noose yet. But I think they're getting to that point really where they can Amazon can can dominate the grocery business. And I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out on the price side, but on the selection side, uh, they're going to have to deliver things that are the most profitable to them, that are easiest to to uh, to get from the from the warehouse to the home in in profitable fashion. So nobody's as big as Amazon, and its size in the grocery business will accomplish what nobody really. Th- thinks is possible and in that respect the Amazon acquisition of uh, Whole Foods winds up being uh, I think it's just a subterfuge uh, that they're they're trying the uh, Amazon is pretending that it can get uh, the the Whole Foods model with food delivery profitable but uh, but I, I, I think that's just a distraction that they don't really that, that they may continue with Whole Foods as a lost leader, but I don't think that uh, the public's going to get quite the, the shopping, the upscale shopping options that that uh, Whole Foods offers. Uh, they're not going to get that with the when Amazon really gets uh, control of warehousing groceries. And uh, they seem to have perfected robot workers to work in their warehouses. Now they can. The robots can sort out things that before you needed human hands and fingers to do. That's pretty amazing. And, and you know, there's always going to be a preference on part of most shoppers, I think, to go to the store and and to uh, squeeze the grapefruits and smell the melons or whatever. Uh, Amazon's going to, they have to eliminate that preference or they have to, like, uh, dampen it quite, uh, quite a bit. That's what they're going to do. Um but and the robots, when when you take that to its logical conclusion, that the whole food chain, the food supply and distribution, is not going to have many human hands in it. That's hugely deflationary. It puts it puts a lot a, a lot of workers out of business. And uh, to the extent that that, that they're not going to be, we'd like to think that that the whole foods model, where the warehouse food supply buyer is dealing with small farmers, but they're not. I think it's going to push agriculture toward even more uh, the mega business model. So um, so uh, I don't think Amazon, in, in its relentless pursuit of efficiency, is going to be able to deal with, with the small farmers. So I, I, this is pretty dark, uh, not to say grim vision, but I think that's where it's headed, and it's only with the... Uh, player like Amazon that can scale up even beyond what what Walmart may have reckoned up to this point. Only Amazon can do it. We'll have more with Rick Ackerman right after this. Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, Grand Portage.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Rick Ackerman. Rick, what's your take on Facebook, a company that refuses to obey privacy laws in Canada? Says, we don't care. They say well, that they're going to improve privacy by not allowing live streaming following the New Zealand mass shooting. Are they a wolf in sheep's clothing? They're a dead duck, I think. Um you know, increasingly their millennial core audience is deserting them and leaving just us senior citizens uh, as Facebookers. But the fundamental problem for Facebook 
is that its most profitable way of operating is very simply to gather as much data as it can on you, which means intruding on your privacy to the extent possible, and taking that information and selling it not even to the highest bidder, but to anybody who can who can pay for it, anybody who wants information and can and pay for it. So, so that puts a, a Facebook on a on a, a collision course, really, between uh, a regulatory environment that's uh, that is looking at Facebook as a as a serial violator of privacy rights, and as much as Facebook pretends that it's kind of changing things to give you more privacy that that goes directly against what's really making them money. So they're going to keep saying that they're doing this, this, and that to to give users more privacy, but to the extent that they're actually doing that, it's only going to hurt their revenues. And I think ultimately they're going to have to bend in the direction of collecting less data and selling it in less obnoxious ways, less... less um, uh, so... So the handwriting's on the wall for that company, and whether or not they are politically wrestled to the ground is one thing. But but there's going to be popular support for um, for reducing Facebook's ability to collect all kinds of data on us. So I think that the popular will, rather than a pure political um, uh, mechanism, is going to is going to hold Facebook back. Well, Zuckerberg hasn't made himself all that popular by refusing to appear before public hearings in both Britain and Canada. Yeah, he sometimes appears anyway, and and he just sort of bamboozles most of his uh, audience. And when he appeared before the U.S. Congress, um, he was pretty slick. Uh, I think a lot of congressmen went away from that hearing thinking, "What what this guy say?" But he can short, he can really talk a blue streak, and um, and and nobody really knows. I mean, it's not as though Facebook has divulged all of the details of its proprietary model, um, and the senators and and congressmen just kind of pick away at it. But uh, nobody understands exactly how Facebook makes its money. But we all kind of get the gist of it that, that they're that they're collecting as much information on each of us as they possibly can, and they're selling it to everybody. They're, they're selling it in ways that nobody had imagined before, and, and whenever we, these things come to light, they're really pretty disturbing. Uh, also, do you think it'll still be a disruptive force in the Canadian and U.S. elections? No, I, I think that was always overrated. It's like, you know, the, the, the thinking of the, everybody who... Who, who's pushing this Trump collusion idea, the thinking is that Russia puts out stuff and we're all idiots and we just sort of vote the way Russian propaganda would have us vote. But I, I don't think, I, I don't think, I think the, uh, the influence of Facebook and social media on elections is really pretty over, it, it's, it's drastically overrated that people kind of vote the way they do. The, the country is, is split. It's like half, the country is going to vote one way no matter what they read, and the same with the other half. So to suggest that, that social media is going to affect the outcome, I think, is, uh, is stretching the point. Rick, thank you so much for chatting with us. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Jim, as always. Thanks for inviting me on. My guest has been Rick Ackerman, editor of the newsletter Rick's Picks. His website, rickackerman.com. If you have any questions for Rick or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Find us on Twitter at HowStreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.